Welcome, I'm Catherine Ibbett. I'm the Fellow in French at Trinity. And this evening we're celebrating Professor Valerie Wirth's amazing translation of Agrippa d'Aubigné's uh, extraordinary text, Les Tragiques. Um, let me make a couple of housekeeping points. First of all, I'm going to ask you to stay muted until the Q&A session. Um, so you can mute uh, down probably at the bottom left of your Zoom screen. And if you have questions for the Q&A, if they come to mind during the talk, you can already start putting them in the chat box and you'll find the uh, little chat sign at the bottom of your screen and the chat should appear to the right um, of the screen. You can put questions in the chat box as we go along. That will help me to group them together. Or you can write hand or raise your hand and I'll, um, I should be able to, to see people. Um, I want to remind you, as Sarah said, we're recording this. Um, if you're, you'll only be seen if your video is turned on. So if you don't want to be recorded uh, for the Trinity website, you can turn your video off and hide. But we are entre amis here, I think. Um, it shouldn't be a problem. No names get included on the video. Let me say um, something about Valerie before she says something about the tragique. So old members and colleagues will know Valerie in her role as an extraordinary senior tutor. Since 2009, Valerie has been responsible for the strategic planning of colleges' academic activities, for overseeing the appointment of academics. Thank you, Valerie. For the admission of undergraduates and graduates and for the academic progress of students once they're on course. And I want to say, um, it was always extraordinary to have Valerie in charge of things, but it was especially extraordinary during COVID when uh, people in a lot of other institutions felt a lot more fragile and a lot more vulnerable um, than we did at Trinity. We were looked after um, with extraordinary energy, and uh, I think we're all ext extremely grateful to you for that. Valerie's just stepped down from this role as senior tutor, but continues as fellow and tutor for graduates alongside Rebecca Bullard, who's her successor as senior tutor. Uh, some old members might also remember Valerie as a lecturer in French at Trinity from 1984 to 1989 in the time when Frank Barnett was the tutorial fellow in French um, alongside Clive Griffin in Spanish. When I came to Trinity as fellow in French, I already knew Valerie I didn't know uh, quite how extraordinary she was going to be as an as academic manager, but I already knew her as a leading scholar in early modern French literature, as a specialist in humanism and translation in Renaissance France, a specialist of med medicine and obstetrics in early modern Europe, of Renaissance French poetry and 17th century French theater amongst other things. And I've often thought when we have little kind of um, side uh, confidential conversations, Valerie, um, about your fabulous book of 1999 with the title Confidential Strategies, um, about the role of the confidant in French drama, not that I, I think the tutor, senior tutor relationship is one of um, confidant and hero, but that there's something about the managing, the, the, the confidant's role of moderating the excesses of the characters in tragedy seems to be especially pertinent. Um, you somehow managed to um, carry these strategies across uh, into academic life. But today we're going to hear about this um, really astounding translation of a text. If you've uh, had a go at reading it, you'll know quite how extraordinarily difficult it is, I think, conceptually, emotionally and linguistically. Um, it's a really extraordinary feat um, to have translated it, um, and it, this is a, a beautiful translation, and I think it will be immensely important um, for a lot of people in early modern studies. It's really going to open up thinking about the French wars of religion um, to a new group. So I'm going to hand over to Valerie, um, who will talk us through what she's done, and then we can ask her how it came about. Thanks so much, Valerie. Thank you, Catherine. Gosh, I feel very embarrassed by such a wonderful um, introduction. I'll just see if I can get my PowerPoint to come up. Is that okay, visible to everyone? Yes. Um, so sorry, that's just so I know I've got the right PowerPoint at the beginning rather than me bragging about the book. But one of the wonderful things today is I can see I've got some students that I taught about 30 something years ago when I was a lecturer and who are part of the continuum. And I know some of you were 
there to work, both to say goodbye to Jonathan, but also to welcome Catherine. And then I've got colleagues from today, not least Pierre, who's um, working while Catherine's on leave this year, and colleagues from other disciplines and librarians and people from the academic office. So it's really people from all walks of life. Um, and because I thought some of you will know a lot about 16th century French, and some of you are coming to it from outside and sort of thinking, what did Valerie spend these years doing? I try and talk on different levels. Some of it will be quite specialist, but some of it will be a little bit broader. And I try and divide what I'm saying into four slightly unequal parts. I'll start talking a little bit um, about very briefly about what I think is the role of translation generally. Um, I'll then talk about why this particular text to translate. Then I'll just choose a few extracts from the text in English and talk about what I think they show about it as a text. And then if you'll allow me to talk a bit as a linguistic specialist, at the end, I'll talk a little bit about the, the difficulties of translating early modern texts. And then I'm really up for your questions and thoughts on it. So I suppose I've spent a, quite a long time. In fact, it's, I think, 40 years ago yesterday that I first set off to France um, to teach over there, and I was teaching French students 16th century French literature for many strange reasons, just before I started as a lecturer at Trinity a year or two later. And I think I've always seen translation as about building bridges. Um, on the one hand, it's quite functional, and it's so wonderful that some of you here today who studied French 30 something years ago, have yourself been practicing translators or used your French in contexts where it matters that you can build those bridges, not least in Brussels, in France, in Luxembourg. So you know, great, modern languages is doing the right things. But translation's also about aesthetic achievement. I won't make claims for my own translation, but I think there is for a translator always a sense of looking for how we say something as well as we can. But in a sense, what I've become much more aware of through my career is translation as a cultural enterprise, that one's not just translating words, so it's not perhaps just a sign at a campsite, you're translating between different cultures, and in particular, between different periods in my case, so between the 16th century and the 21st century, as well as between French and English. I think though that translation is also about points of resistance. And one of the things that always interests people is what can't be translated. So one of the things you can see from the cover of the book is that I couldn't translate the title. In the end, I've ended up with Agrippa Daubigny's Les Tragiques, with Les Tragiques being in French. Um, I played with all sorts of translations of it in English. I tried tragic tales, tragic stories, tragic histories, all of them seemed quite limited, and I can talk about that in questions, but I actually think that the French itself comes from an underlying Latin assumption. It would have been the tragic things are new to plural, which Daubigny's audience would have recognized, which is probably lost to most modern readers now. And in the end, leaving it in French was almost my way of saying, this is a French book you're going to read. I put most of it in English, but, there's some things that resist that translation. As one's well testing what can't be translated, I also see translation as testing the boundaries of different disciplines. So over a career and unintentionally, I've perhaps crossed boundaries in that I think of myself as a literary and linguistic scholar, but I'm treading on territory that I know belongs to historians. And one of the reasons for wanting to translate this work is that historians want to access accounts of the French Civil Wars. And I'll talk a bit more about the wars in a moment. But I became aware this is a difficult long poem, 9,000 lines of 16th century, quite taught French, and modern day historians were saying, well, it would be interesting to know what it says, but we need it in English. And there was a translation of about the first third that was done back in the 1950s by a very um, imaginative American DPhil student, but it wasn't completed, it's not been published. So I basically worked knowing that was there, didn't look at that translation very much while I was doing my own, and I deliberately started in the middle so that I didn't look at what had already been translated, and then went back and did the last books that had been translated, so that I'd by then found my own way of translating. Um, 
And on the question of liminality, I think it was perhaps just relevant to say that what I translated previously, um, not sure if people can actually see that book, um, is Pregnancy and Birth in Early Modern France, where I translated medical histories for people. And that was in some ways easier because it was prose and I knew historians of medicine want to know what was said about birth in the 16th, 17th century. So it was prose, it didn't matter too much if I changed it. I hadn't translated poetry before and that was a big challenge to me. And I haven't translated it into rhyming verse. I can't do that. So I've gone for blank verse and tried to keep some of the elements, but accepting I can't keep all of them. Now, why translate this particular work? Well, if anyone happened to click on Le Mans website yesterday, they might have been as pleased as I was to notice that the same picture I've got on the cover, um, which, now let me just make sure I can get there. This is Agrippa Daubigny, I'll come back to him, but this is the painting by Francois Dubois, which was done fairly soon after the horrible massacre of St. Bartholomew, where Protestants who'd gone to Paris for a royal wedding were massacred by Catholics. It wasn't altogether the Catholics' fault, but it ended up being um, an absolutely horrible thing. It's still remembered by the French, I suppose, in the way the gunpowder plot is in English, that most French people, if you say le massacre de la Saint-Barthélemy, they will know that it happened in that period and that it was awful. And there it was mentioned on the monde with the same picture yesterday. So I immediately clicked on it and thought, no, not my book, why have they got the picture? And it's because a recent historian called Jérémy Foua, F-O-A, has just written a book trying to tell about the tales, not of the great people involved in the massacre, but about 25 people who were killed when in fact about 6,000 were in Paris, just done archival research to tell the tales of ordinary people. And that resonated with me because one of the things that happens in Daubigny is you get lots of parts about very well-known people and some parts just recording an unnamed woman from an area of France who said such and such a thing. And for a moment you get these stories that are happening behind the big story. So I thought it was quite nice that Le Monde is still talking about this. Um, but it does seem a strange choice for me. Agrippa Daubigny, and one of the things if you talk to anyone else about him, there's a big debate now in France about whether to make him Daubigny or Aubigny. I grew up knowing it as Daubigny, so I tend to say that, though modern scholars are moving to Aubigny. Um, because the particle may have been added later. Um, he's not the sort of person who I think in real life, I would have said, oh, I must go and meet him. He was a virulent Protestant converted in his early age. Um, he was a soldier. He was known as being quite irascible. He was also someone who wrote very satirical literature and he fell out with almost everyone he knew. So in the end of his life, he had to leave France and went to Geneva, the center of Protestant thinking. So although that shows him as a rather smiling, friendly man, he wasn't necessarily. And Le Tragique is telling the story from the Protestant side and it's an incredibly partisan work. So although I come from a Protestant background myself, I found myself blanching at just how Protestant the account was and how ruthless he was to his Catholic um, counterparts. Um, I think that to me, his account is useful because it gives a literary account and insights into a period where historians are always looking for different documents. So someone like Fua, the recent historian, will look in archives, whereas Daubigny tries to give a picture of France of that period, but also to set it within the context of the Protestant understanding. And this is a period when Protestantism is only taking off in Europe. He's really the second generation where you could think you were a Huguenot Protestant, trying to set it within what they see as God's immense plan for the world. So he's framing his history both within what's happened in France, what's happened in Europe, but what's happened in what he sees as God's plan for the world. Now, the other interesting thing about the book, because I just love books, so that's why I'm really pleased that we've got some of our librarians here, is that the book was not tremendously successful. So it wasn't like Milton's Paradise Lost or some of the other works where you could say, I'm translating a work that everyone at the time read, you couldn't exist without knowing it, or Montaigne's essays. It came out in 1616 anonymously, and that's the um, front cover of the first edition. 
And what's immediately apparent is that it's a rather cheap front cover. It's got this odd lozenger in the middle where you'd normally expect a portrait of the author. And instead you're told that it was given to the public by an act of theft by Prometheus, Prometheus who stole fire from the gods. Um, that's actually a pseudonym for Daubigny. It was published in the desert. Well, France doesn't have many deserts. And it's written by LBDD, Le Bouc du Désert, um, which is the Billy Goat of the Desert, which is actually a nickname for Daubigny from his friends. And it was published in 1616. You at least know that. Now, it was probably published from the press where Daubigny himself lived. And I just wanted to give you a sense of how he's not at the centre of France at this time. So you've got a map of France with modern countries juxtaposed so you can find your way around. He's not in Paris. He's not even in Orléans or Saumur, the big centres. He's based down in Maillé, out on the southwest, which is where most of the Protestants gather. And there were probably something like two to 400 copies of this first edition. Well, you can find copies of that. What is like gold dust and almost impossible to find is the second undated edition, which is pretty ragged if you can find it. Um, at least you've got his name on it then. It's probably posthumous, we're not quite sure, um, but it's almost impossible to find copies. And it seems as though it really fell out of favour. And the reason why, oh, hello, Samuel. You've got a wonderful biblical name, haven't you? So the reason it fell out of favour is I think that Daubigny had been writing it since 1570 or 72, publishing it in 1616. He just came after the event. He wanted to convert Protestants to arguing their case. So it would be a bit like feeling very strongly about Brexit, writing about it, and then publishing it 40 years later when hopefully everyone's moved on and the world's in a better place. So that's why it wasn't a tremendous success at the time. But in the 19th century, people found copies of it, came back to it, and it's now recognized as one of the jewels of early modern French literature. Um, what happened to the manuscripts of it is also interesting. This is Daubigny's second wife, um, who's written at the top of a manuscript that just after her husband died and they were based in Geneva, the late Monsieur Daubigny, a few days before his death, ordered me to hand this book over to his very dear and respected brother-in-law, whom he asked to keep it as a proof of his affection. And this says something about how Protestants saw literature. It was something that was a témoignage. It was a proof, but also a demonstration. It belonged to families and to communities. And interestingly, Daubigny handed it over to his wife to give to his brother. Women played quite a large role, although in some ways he's very patriarchal. The manuscript survived because his wife gave it to his brother-in-law who deposited it in the British Library. So I have seen the manuscript in the British Library, which was quite a moving thing to see. So I want to look a little bit at the text and tell you why I think it's an interesting book. Um, very broadly, so you get the structure, it's seven long books of epic. If you know any epic from Virgil or Homer, think of something like the Odyssey, the Iliad, they usually have 12 books. Seven is a biblical number, not um, a classical number. Um, and it has a little preface. And he works from looking at the state of France today to looking at martyrs and massacres, and then at the end talking about how God is going to put the world to rights, to give a very simple summary of it. Um, as I talk through things, I thought, so you've got a sense of how people in the period saw some of the things he writes about. It might be helpful to share these engravings with you, hoping they're not too scary for Samuel, um, that Daubigny may or may not have known. Um, Perissan and counterpart of his Tortorel were very skilled engravers who did wonderful line drawings of various things from the civil wars. And it gives you a sense of the energy and confusion of the period. So this is one of the first ones with the massacre at Vassy, which probably started off the civil wars. And you just get a sense of people charging into a barn. So the well-dressed people are the Catholics who charge into the barn where the Protestants are worshiping because they worship at home. Huguenot, the word for Protestants is probably people who worship at home and massacred them. And that was the start of the civil wars. Um, the Protestants also did some fairly, um, how should we say, um, provocative things to the Catholics. So with these sort of things in mind, you get the tone of what Daubigny is writing about. And in the preface, he addresses his book, as all good readers did in that period, 
And he says to his book when it was published, go book, you're indeed too fine to have been born in the tomb from which my exile delivers you. His exile meaning he was stuck in Geneva rather than France. I would perish alone for us both. My child, start to live as your father prepares to die. He didn't die till he was 80, he lived a long time. And he tells his book, be bold, do not hide away. Be no cause of shame or fear. Let, you, let what you say not diminish or suppress your valor or your courage. So he's telling his book to be brave and to say everything he wants it to. And at the very end of the preface, it's about 400 lines. He tells his book, which he addresses almost like a child, go forth my work. It's rather a biblical address to it. Leave my arms, my heart sighs, my mind is weary. Your birth was legitimate. God himself gave the subject. I dedicate you to the church alone. For support you have right, truth for your undertaking, your reward is immortality. And to me, the key words there are that God gave the subject, the book's dedicated to the church rather than to rich patrons, and truth underlies it from his way of thinking. And it's meant to be immortal because it tells the truth of what God describes. Now, the first book is entitled in French, Les Misères, and I chose to translate that as sufferings. Um, because it's about the sufferings of France. Um, there are other ways it could have been translated, but that was what seemed to work for me. Translating titles is always one of the most difficult things. And it's a very emotional book. And I should pay tribute here to Catherine's own work, Compassion's Edge, where she's written about Daubigny, but many other authors in the 17th century and shown what a difficult concept compassion was in the 17th century and helped us think about how we read emotions in historical literature. Well, what Daubigny is doing at the beginning of his book is trying to suggest the awful emotions that people face as he attacks Rome, the Roman Catholic Church. And he's likening himself to Caesar facing a nightmare in which Caesar feared a terrifying nightmare he saw Rome trembling, hideous, disheveled, in tears, sobbing, half dead, despairing, wringing her hands, preventing, haunting Caesar's advance towards the blood of his kin. And all those different emotions there are what he sees as being so critical to what he's trying to portray. And in this first part, um, in Sufferings, he depicts France, and I think most of us here today are people who love France. And what he's trying to show is a France that's torn apart by civil wars. And it's not just the France of the Protestants, it's the France of the Catholics, but it's also very much the France of the provinces, not just Paris. So the provinces where people would normally expect to live comfortably, or at least to live in, in sympathy with the land, but they can't. And he calls upon Melpomene, the muse of tragedy, to begin with, and to depict France in several ways. And the first one is France as a suffering mother. And this is a very famous passage. So it's one of the ones where I knew anyone who looks at the translation is going to look and see what I've done with it. I shall depict France as a suffering mother her arms bearing the burden of two children, obviously the two religions. The stronger arrogantly grasps the nipples of both life-giving breasts. Then with blows, scratches, punches and kicks, he destroys the share nature intended for his twin. And again, I felt there the sort of energy of it, of trying to suggest France being torn apart by the two religions. Um, and I suppose one of the things I felt as I was translating this work is, it's a work about how a nation copes with having different beliefs and different groups in it. And I was finishing the translation. I think I started in about 2013 and I was coming towards the end as a whole series of atrocities happened across Europe, but particularly in France, the 2015 attack in Paris and in Bataclan, I think hit so many of us because we knew people there we weren't used to these things happening in our own time. And some of those lines resonated with me and I think people I spoke to, because there was this sense, even today, France feels a nation that's being torn apart in ways we don't expect. And that are awful to those of us who don't want to feel we have to pay, belong to just one group or another. Um, so another short extract from Sufferings where he talks about the land and the terrible things that happened to it. 
Men are no longer human. They feed upon grasses, carrion, and undrawn meat, stealing food prepared for animals. The dubious root is taken without hesitation, provided only it can be softened and eaten. Hunger's counsel teaches teeth perforce to steal the bark and the robe of the forest. The untilled earth is ashamed to be seen seeks laborers, yet none now remains. And this idea of the earth itself suffering was very powerful. And in French, as you well know, um, nouns have genders. So la terre being French fits very well with France the mother and France the earth. And the earth, which also bids the children to return to it again and take refuge there. And one other short passage from sufferings to give you the flavour, um, the attacks that Daubigny launches. One of them is on Catherine de' Medici, um, who really he vilifies. She was the queen mother, the regent, and a lot of work has been subs done subsequently um, restoring her reputation. But the Protestants tried to suggest that she had actually ordered the massacre. And in that painting by Dubois, you can just see that by the castle, there's a woman in black. She always wore black because she mourned for her dead husband, who's looking on um, almost like a witch. And so you also have a sense of Daubigny trying to stir up anger and depicting her in a way that is almost like the witch of Endor, I think. But when the fires of France, half dead, need her to blow on them in every corner, ever ready for evil, ever averse to good, she fears good acts, never fears to do harm. She pollutes the air a deadly fury. She clouds the sky with black smoke from her nostrils. She breathes upon the flowers. The flowers instantly lose life and color. Her touch brings death. The poisoner kills all the regions with the glance of a basilisk. Um, and that idea of Catherine de' Medici as a poisoner, she comes from Florence. She's known as being skilled with perfumes, but also knowing what goes into poisons. So it's a rather horrific image of her casting evil throughout France, when in fact modern historians would say she did much to try and um, bring balance and moderation between the two parties. But Daubigny is not a balanced historian. That's in a way why he's vital, because he gives one side of the story. The other book that I wanted just to take a few extracts from is the one that talks about the massacres and apologies here for the goriness, but because I think it is the part um, just before the massacres, there's the books dedicated to all the martyrs of Protestantism. So this is again a detail of one of the early martyrs. And it's quite interesting that historians have said early martyrs tended to be burned at the stake. In fact, they really the Catholic authorities realized that that's just produced crowds that wanted to participate and glorify the martyrdom. So they very soon came around to deciding it was quicker to dispatch them by hanging or other quicker methods of killing them and not have so many people watching. Um, here you've got, again, rather horrible image, but the massacre at Ombres, which was one of the earlier massacres, and Daubigny doesn't work in chronological order. Daubigny was taken aged eight by his father, who was a convert to Protestantism, to see the heads, and you can see hanging from the walls, dead bodies there, and made to swear that he would always be loyal and avenge this massacre at Ombres of a number of the leading Protestants by the Catholic authorities who simply felt they had to repress um, unacceptable civic behavior. So it's with these sort of things in mind that we find Daubigny really expressing his anger. Here behold the sweet French enraged against each other, their souls, minds, feelings and strength changed. Such is a hideous portrait of a civil war that displays beneath its feet a small town. In other words, the town of Ombres full of mutilated bodies laid out in the square, in its rivers are drowned, on its battlements are hanged, there upon the scaffold that fills the whole square, among the condemned, one raises his face towards heaven, pointing to the warm, steaming blood of the first to be beheaded. Then he shouted aloud, raising his hands, blooded with the blood of his own, O oh God, powerful avenger, your hands will not rest upon your breast, for this you will see from high heaven, and for a hundred thousand deaths you will take vengeance. So this is partly a list literature of testimony and crying out for revenge, which I think, again, rings bells for what we see sometimes today in nations where we're very divided between different religions and people are feeling they need to take horrific, very violent 
vengeance. One of the most upsetting massacres was at Tours, um, upsetting, I think, because of both the number killed and the way in which the bodies fell into the river and even children were massacred. I won't read the most horrific parts, but again, the engraving, which probably Daubigny saw and details picked up. But the tableau of Tours, more hideous stain, effaced previous tableau, as the impetuous multitude rushed towards brutal acts of cruelty that would have shocked the icy Scythians. There the all-powerful eyes clear vision shone, observing the hand and the knife that kill. Here a scene dragged from the Trown's churches, 300 bound, half dead, starved for three days, then handed over for the butchering mob to massacre still trussed together by the river. There the tragic voices rent the unfeeling air. There the children in the water were sold for a shilling, snatched from the cellars they died without knowledge of names, errors and times, marks and differences. And it seems that some people so wanted to partake in the murder that children were literally sold to people to kill. I mean, it's unthinkable, but in a sense, what Dubin is saying is we mustn't forget this. And we need to remember the unnamed, those who exactly in this new work by Fua, he is busy researching. Um, the main event that people remember from the period is the massacre of St. Bartholomew. And, um, I just wanted here to suggest that everything in the poem isn't necessarily gloomy. Um, the, one of the leading Protestants who is killed and whose head is cut off, um, the um, Admiral um, Coligny, is described as when he's already dead, going around and looking at pictures of what happened in the massacre. So it's a rather strange double take. You know he's dead, but he's looking at pictures in heaven of the massacre. And he's seen as laughing, and somehow laughter is the way in which the Protestants triumph over what's happened, because heaven will, according to them, restore things. So the, uh, just a couple of lines of the translation here. With a laughing face, our Cato, in other words, Coligny, directed our gaze with his, his finger pointing at himself, run through. Then he showed us how he is cut into pieces. His head runs to Rome. His body becomes a plaything for the eager rabble. So there's an idea that if you're a martyr, you will triumph in heaven and you can look at these horrible things that happen where your head is sent to Rome for the Pope. And there's actually a painting in the Vatican, which I have seen, it's in one of the private rooms of the massacre of St. Bartholomew, commissioned by the Pope to celebrate it. Um, and his body was cut up and distributed amongst the crowd, but he can look down from on high, saved by God, and feel that there is a higher truth for him. Now, I don't want us to end on totally negative notes. So um, I wanted just with the massacres to talk about how this particular book of the massacres ends, because how do you end the book that's talked about all these horrible things? Well, Daubigny does something very unexpected for a Protestant. He commemorates the bodies of the Protestants. And remember, Protestants had very simple ceremonies. The body of Calvin in Geneva, no one knows where it's buried because he didn't want to have people going to the tomb. Their Protestant ceremonies for funerals were as simple as they could be. But he imagines the god of the ocean. So it's almost like something from mythology seeing the rivers running with blood and being angry and rescuing these bodies and saving them. And so this is the God of the ocean. It's just an image, but I think it's just a very beautiful one. Come children of heaven, cried the old man, the God of the oceans, heirs of the kingdom to whom heaven accords its expanse for a cemetery. O saints whom I push back, it is for you, not with you that I am justly angry. And so this god of the ocean advances in the Loire, comes to its shores, the crimson sands lined with so many dead. Carefully, he collects them, picks them up, these dear corpses as nature has turned on itself. Having taken care of all, he turns his gaze, his face serene, and thus addresses heaven. I shall keep them until God commands me to render up the sons of happiness to their happiness. So there's a sense for Daubigny in which this is a poem of the defeated, and yet at the same time, it promises them they will reach um, heaven and they will be vindicated. Now, I'll leave the text there and just briefly say a few words about the translation. And I hope people who um, don't spend so much time on French will allow me just to have a few bits of French with the English there. So for me, I was producing a translation which 
most people would read without the French beside it. If I'd been doing a translation with the French alongside it, I'd have felt more constrained. But what constraints did I accept? I thought every line of French had to be translated into English. And I made myself keep to blank verse so I couldn't, on the whole, have more lines in English than in French, but I could allow myself within a sentence, and particularly within a couplet, to move words around a little bit. Um, I also did a critically annotated translation, and that made my life a lot easier because I thought, who am I translating for? Mostly for academics and students, and they want to be able to get to the text easily. French students have a choice between two editions, um, a thinner one, which they can afford, and a bigger one, which they might or might not be able to afford, and which is now running to two volumes and a lot of footnotes. So in the English, I use the French footnotes, and I've put little letters to show which edition I took them from, so I was being very honest which ideas were my own and which weren't. And I added more footnotes of my own to explain what I was doing with the translation, where I thought it would be helpful. I also wrote an introduction to give people a quick way into the text. I put in some of these illustrations so that people could have a visual way in. And I had great fun doing indexes at the end so people could find their way around. And I can talk about indexes. I love doing indexes. I think it's the way people find things they want in a text in the modern world. But the sort of things I do, I am quite interested in translation theory. And there's a theory by Georges Jean Dubilly, one of the Protest uh, one of the Renaissance poets, that Translation is all about loss and gain. You win some, you lose some. So I think that that's a pretty good way of working, that you do what you can. So in this example, um, which is a speech by one of the martyrs, um, I can keep some of the repetitions. Daubigny uses lots of repetitions. So um, you make your ills such without you, they are not ills. He likes repetition in the same line. He also likes very simple statements. Now, sometimes the statements are simple. Sometimes, as you can see, things then run on for the next five lines or more. So I, could, I try to keep simplicity where I can. He likes patterns within lines, starting lines with the same word, the two ou. Où tu ouvres, tu cries ta poitrine en famille, où tu gâtes le bois, l'encens et la fumée. So I kept those with the two words. That's quite easy. The next two, I thought I couldn't do much with the venge and fee, with the V and the F having similar sounds, but I could keep to having two command forms there. So they're the sort of ways that I've been thinking on a sort of fairly small level about how I manage to keep some things that aren't so easy. But of course, there are things I can't keep. Um, oh, this was another example where the earth is speaking to the children, says that they can go back into her womb. So sometimes I can add things that aren't quite in French at that time, but I know they come up later in the poem. So this was the example of the earth speaking. And although the two lines don't start with the same sound, in other lines in the French, they will. So I thought it was okay here that I could have an and in one line and a new in another line to keep that sense of the sound patterns mattering, even if they didn't actually matter in this one, they might have mattered a few lines later. And I'd give people a sense of what's going on. I should say for those of you who are interested in the French poetry that the line length is Alexandrian. Those of you who studied French with me 30 something years ago, you remember doing French versification. And Daubigny had a choice. At that point, when he started writing in 1572, he could have used decasyllabic lines, 10 syllables. It was more fashionable to use Alexandrian, 12 syllables, and it gives him a longer line length to play around with. The advantage of an Alexandrian is that you get a break in the middle of the line. Um, for example, par deux fois mes enfants dans l'obscur de mon ventre. So six syllables, six syllables. The slight downside of Alexandrians is they can begin to sound a bit prosaic. Um, so I also had to watch for that in the translation. Um, this I had an, as an example of voices. So one of the things that happened as I was working on the translation is you have to pay attention to every single line. And 
if I said at the beginning, I felt in some ways quite daunted by the poem because it was by a male author, it was very violent and I'm female, I'm definitely not violent. It was writing about a lot of very gruesome things. One of the things it had in it were a lot of points where he gave voice to individuals. And I wanted these individual voices to speak. And I think that's what I feel I've managed to achieve if I've achieved something as a translator. And this was a rather beautiful one where there's a girl who's unnamed who dies rather sadly. And as she dies at the end, Daubigny actually thinks as she dies, she can't speak. So who can actually speak? Well, she's going to have a mouth ending a prayer of praise and it's actually going to be God who weeps over her. Il l'armoya sur elle, il ferma de ses doigts la bouche de louange, achevant sa prière. So you have this idea that sometimes the people will speak and she speaks a prayer of praise. Sometimes things are so, so beyond us that only God can speak. And towards the very end of the poem, and this is something I'm now working on for a short article, as we all do when we finish things. Um, at the very end of the poem, Daubigny tries to give the sense of what will happen in the world to come. And of course, it's the impossible. No one can ever put this into words. But his only way of talking about it is saying that his senses are departing from him. Mes sens n'ont plus de sens, l'esprit de moi s'envole, mon cœur de ravi se tait, ma bouche est sans parole. So the idea that he is wordless. And what I'm actually working on at the moment is the idea that my senses can no longer feel. Um, this was quite a different, difficult one for me to translate. I still don't think I've quite got it there. Mes sens n'ont plus de sens. It's both senses as in the five senses, sight and sound, but it's also rational sense and the spirit departing. And he says that in the world to come, the five senses will all find new expressions. And I found masses of examples of the poem of um, how vision and how hearing will change, some of taste changing, some of touch changing, but almost none of smell changing. So I'm now on a quest to find out what Huguenots thought about the role of, of um, scent and smell, because they didn't have incense in church, and how scent would exist in a world to come. So that's something I'm just working on slightly. And I suppose I can probably end at that point and say, one does something, and what one hopes is that other people will be able to use it. I think of my translations useful, it's useful to students of French literature who might feel they can approach Daubigny and they can always have a quick look at the translation if they get stuck or they can read the introduction before they start. I hope it will encourage historians to feel they can use a work of literature as one of their sources. And I think and this is something I know Catherine's worked on so much in the States, that people working on comparative literature who will perhaps know their Milton or their Latin epics or their Spanish epics will be able to add this as one of the ones that they can look at. And I did add in my book um, a very brief summary of what goes on in each book, just so people can find their way around, because I thought that was something useful I could do. So I hope those people will use it. Um, and I'm very, very grateful to three American colleagues, friends of Catherine's, who actually, unbeknown to me, were the critical readers for the press for it. And they improved the translation just beyond words um, and I'm just so grateful to them and we're now together working on doing a handbook on Daubigny which is going to be reading Daubigny or Aubigny possibly for this one and trying to think about different ways in which people from different backgrounds will want to access the text so I'm in no way displacing or replacing the French text but I think I'm providing a way for people to have access to it. Um, and thank you for bearing with me today, and I'll be really interested to hear your thoughts on it. Thanks so much, Valerie. That was wonderful. Um, and uh, I, I do want to emphasize, uh, just for everybody, quite what an extraordinary feat this is. Talk about stealing fire. I mean, uh, for, for years, um, I'd go to places and people would say, and is your colleague really translating Les Tragiques? Um, and of course, it's not just that it's an extraordinarily complex text, but it's also to do it uh, while carrying um, the workload. Um, certainly an extraordinary feat. Um, are there any questions? Do people, I think I can see you all on screen if you turn your video on. 
or, or you can write in the chat. Um, Oh, I can now see everyone. That's really wonderful. I've got a question, Sarah. Um, I don't know anything about French uh, or the poem, but I was very interested to read the introduction and the summaries I thought were very interesting. Um, I have, how on earth did you manage to condense lines into just one sentence? That, was, that just seemed like a feat of like amazingness because that's something that is really hard to do when you're summarizing something into just one sentence. Um, gosh, it was hard to do. Um, I think I thought it was probably one of the most useful things I could do. So as I've sort of gone on in my career and done other things, I've become more conscious that when I'm writing, I need to be writing for an audience or speaking to an audience. And I thought if people are going to use this book, they've got to be able to find their way around it. And I've just got to be able to summarise. Um, and I suppose I've got quite good at doing summaries. It's funny, as a senior tutor, one of the things governing bodies sometimes say to me is, could you summarise the 16 page document in a couple of sentences so we know whether we need to read it or not? So I did that. Um, I'm sure people could argue with the summaries. I think what perhaps was more open to questioning is how I've broken it up. So, you know, where I've said sort of this particular section of 50 lines does this, someone else might say, oh, I wouldn't put the break there, I'd have put it here or here. But I reckon it's worth having a go and giving something so people have got something to work with. Um, so Sue's asking, um, she has to leave in a minute, but she's wondering if you might comment on Daubigny's relationship with Henri IV. With pleasure. Like Basil Fulty says, there's a whole conference here. <laughs> there is, and there's also a new biography of Henry IV. So I'll send you the details of Sue. Um, basically, um, Daubigny is an out and out Protestant all through his life. Henry IV, who starts as Henry of Navarre, starts as a Protestant, converts to Catholicism, shifts back to Protestantism and then becomes, as you know, well know, becomes Catholic in order to inherit the French crown. Um, Daubigny never forgives him for that. So he's got some pretty harsh things to say about him. But on the other hand, he wants to try and persuade him to come back to Protestantism. So he's accusing him, but at the same time, um, trying to leave the way open. I think some of Daubigny's harshest criticism is actually for people on his own side, the Protestants who've turned Catholic, as he sees it, for an easier life. So if you're a Catholic, that's bad. But if you were a Protestant and you turned to being a Catholic, it's doubly bad. Um, Matt also has a question. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm 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 a uh, different student in economics, so I'm sorry mm. for uh, for a um, probably uninformed uh, question. I was curious. On one slide, you had um, this example about oh, this sort of you're kind of anticipating this the, a stylistic technique that um, he's using later on, but you kind of mm. like want to want to sort of inaugurate that already, or sort of try to impute that, if I understood that correctly. So you took the style that he's employing later on with this sort of two lines beginning and the, uh, having the same beginning, um, sort of to just sort of, is that so, as I understood, sort of to ease the reader into that particular style. So what are, I was curious that this is sort of a translation, like a um, a thing that sort of is, 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 is being adopted in, in translation and what are the trade-offs with Sort of when do you know whether that whether he wanted to adopt that sort of whether it was on purpose that he adopted that sort of stylistic technique later on and not at the place where you sort of imputed that um i'm not sure whether this is sort of clear i'm not sure whether i'm for no, but it sort of, it's a it's a, mm. in a very interesting trade-off to make i think if i understood the, the 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 slide correctly thanks no you did understand it it's very interesting you've asked that as an economist because I certainly haven't gone through and added up how many times I did something, but I'm thinking when I teach translation, there's a lovely course we have, Advanced Translation, where we look at theories of translation on modern text. And there's one approach to translation, which is about deformation by someone called Behrmans, where he basically lists 
all the things you shouldn't do. And you take off points every time you do things. And one of them is that you add things to the text or you change the text. Um, then there are many other ways of looking at translation that are more creative. But I suppose I always say to students, I think it's quite good to have in mind the Berman's thing of how many negative points have you got just so that you don't go too far away from the original text. Um, I wasn't necessarily always doing something in advance. It's more that I might, within a large text of 9,000 lines, I've got a sense of something Stubner does. And I'm thinking, I can't, you know, if I can copy it in that line, I will do it. If I can't do it in that line, it seems to me that's a valid technique to introduce somewhere else. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Makes sense. In some ways, it reminds me of some things somebody said to me years I think this is you know a, a sort of facetious line but a really telling one about Milton that sometimes you can see him imitating Milton or that just kind of getting to the next yeah. bit or that that there's a sort of um style carryover uh sometimes in repetition I, I can't see Alice has a question do you want to unmute yourself Alice um Yes, I, I wanted to ask. Oh, yeah, let's. <laughs> hello. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I so enjoyed that. And I, I just wanted to say, um, has that put you off for a while? Or are you now champing at the bit to, to translate something else? Because I don't know whether when you get to the end of something so mm -hmm. momentous, you feel, wow, I did that. Now perhaps I could tackle, tackle the next thing. Or are you thinking, oh, gosh, you know, this is... This is something I could, I could do without for a while. <laughs> Never again. Um, it's an interesting question. When I finished it, I definitely didn't want to do a big project again. I think I should also say I did this while I was senior tutor and it fitted in very well with having a day job where I needed my mind on one thing and then I could evenings, weekends, vacations. I could work steadily through translation and almost do about 40 or 50 lines ago, but never more than that, put it aside, come back to it later. Um, what I couldn't have done at that time was written a whole book on something, certainly the introduction, it took a, a summer vacation to write, that wasn't an evening job. So I am now thinking I would like to translate again and that I'm actually missing translating. And I'm trying to work out what I would next like to translate, because I suppose, it's a question that I have to be interested in the work itself. I looked at some shorter poems by Daubigny, but they, they didn't have the same homogeneity as this does. So I wasn't taken in that way by them. Um, I translated quite a lot of the medical work, but that was more because I wanted people to know what it talked about and a little bit the style of it. So I think I am up for it in theory, possibly not as long as this. I'd like it to be something about a quarter of the length. Um, but I have to find the right text to be sure. So if anyone has any suggestions. I was really struck actually in the passages you chose. I mean, I, you, you've had um, an extraordinary sort of cross-disciplinary uh, career of working on different sorts of bodies mm. of writing, but I was really struck suddenly by the way in which uh, this text is also about birth. Or, I mean, I think about maternity, but the, the question of being sort of ripped um, yes, is central yes, here as it, as it is in a very different register, um, different vein in your medical text. I think birth comes in, I mean, again, when I did the index, you know, I obviously my eyes zoomed in on sort of birth, pregnancy, wombs and so on. Some of the imagery is common to a lot of the poets in the period. So the idea that you give birth to a work of literature is a fairly commonplace one. But I think this image of France as the mother, which again was common, but he's really elaborated upon it. it and I've just been reading um, a Catholic, not very good poet of the same period who's writing an epic. So that one I'm not going to translate, Alice. So, you know, I sort of looked and I thought, no, this one doesn't merit translating. Um, although it's, it would be good for people to know about it. It just doesn't talk about it as interestingly. And Daubigny himself had sons and daughters, and he was very concerned about the daughter's education. So there's a sense in which there's a part of him that does resonate with me as being a father concerned for the daughter as well as the son's education. And maybe part of the whole interest in birth is also the Huguenot notion of continuing your dynasty. 
what I have actually got going at the moment, I'll say I've, I've been, I'm usually fairly quiet about what I've got going till I know it's actually going to go. But I also like critical editions. They're sort of a counterpart to translations. And there's a Protestant writer of 1625 who wrote a work on women who want children but can't have them. So I suppose what we call involuntary childlessness. And he's trying to give advice as a doctor, but he also imitates the style of Montaigne's essays. And I would like to do a critical edition of that. So I think it's sort of stuck on my computer at the state where I've got to start doing footnotes on it. Um, so that might keep me busy for the next year or so. And that gives me some reading time to think about translating, I think. Mm. The index here is really extraordinary, the thematic index that you've made. I have to say that there's a wonderful indexing tool that I purchased um, with my Trinity Research Allowance, which allowed me to do it. But I also, again, on this question of people reading the book, I knew that people would come to it for different things. And I find when I'm reading books now, if I can get them digitally, one of the great advantages is you can immediately in a PDF do a search and find the words you want. If as with this book, it's not, I think, available digitally in libraries, then people can only do the index, the search, if they've got a decent index for it. So I put it there thinking most people, if they use it, will want to be able to look in the index and find things. Mm. I mean, yeah, especially thinking about historians, I think, or mm. otherwise monoglots coming to it, um, people who might be thinking about comparative epic. Or, and there's a, mm. a, a truly extraordinary page and a half on religious beliefs and practices. I mean, uh, you yeah, uh, know, a lesser mortal would have given up trying to think about all of that in, in digital. I think it's, this mortal it's, might it's say phenomenal, it's but compromise. it's actually, um, yeah. yeah. You learn a I lot about the text looking at it, I mean, even though yeah. somebody who knows the text. Yes, I think one of my characteristics, close friends and family have said that I'm quite good at sticking at things for better. <laughs> you know, occasionally with this, I felt, I don't think I can finish translating that. I was thinking, but I've done so much of it. I don't want to, you know, it'd be silly to stop now. Mm. And it was a little bit like that with the index. I realized that although the wonderful indexing tool gave me all the head words, it didn't tell me how to organize them. And in a way I did the index at the end. And I think something I might do another time is run the index earlier on because indexes are quite good for making one think about things. Mm. Mm. Yeah, you talked about translation as points of resistance, but um, mm. it, that you have to be resistant to. Other questions? Nikki. Um, on that question of resistance, actually, I was thinking about your sort of what your overall strategy was, if you like, at the high level and principles level of um, the translation, because you talked about your, your, your sort of imagined audience a little bit. Um, and you talked about the fact of having to kind of translate across time as well as across cultures. Um, and I was wondering whether essentially, despite perhaps the, the, the title that, that, that you decided to go with, whether you'd sort of really adopted more a sort of domesticating kind of um, uh, strategy overall, as I say, across time and, 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 and across cultures. But, but also the fact as well that, you know, as, as Catherine was saying a moment ago, you know, there's, there's a sort of genre question as well. So I think you were treating it very much, if I understand correctly, as a sort of literary work, but at the same time, you're aware perhaps your audience might um, be both, you know, students of history as well as of literature. So, so there's sort of um, questions as well about translating across genres as well, to some extent in terms of thinking about your audience. <laughs> That's really interesting as a question. I think I would say I have domesticated. In the end, unless people can read the original, the translation has to get them to understand something about the original. So I think translations that, and there's a modern fashion for leaving so many things in, you know, in the original language that you almost feel, but why would anyone at that point not just read the original? So I'm clear that most of my readers won't read the original and probably won't some might read it alongside, but fewer than would, than would do that, say for Montaigne. Um, translating across time, um, Daubigny himself is known as having a slightly anachronistic style. It's old fashioned. And actually that was quite helpful to me, probably because I'm at the age I am now in my career, that um, I was brought up by Protestant parents um, in a congregational United Reformed Church background. So very much my background was going to church most Sundays, not every Sunday, 
him singing, knowing the Bible quite well. And I could feel that when I was translating quite a lot of the religious language, I could hear hymns at the back of my mind, um, not always consciously, but they were sort of the language I could feel I was translating into. And it seemed to me it was legitimate to do it because Daubigny was about 40 years out of date. So I wanted my translation to be not aggressively 21st century, but to read as though it was probably written by someone in the 19, somewhere between the 1950s and 1980s. Um, and I think that actually sort of worked quite well for me because it sort of got the period where I was growing up and hearing language. Um, and it got something of the flavor Daubigny had for his own audience. Um, as to the domesticating and sort of simplifying, in the end, I've used footnotes where things were tricky references. He uses lots of puns and I just couldn't get those. So like the name of the town, Saint, Saint which is also sens in French. And it, he has a bit where sens is insensé, so the senseless song. And I just, you know, I get senseless song, but it doesn't really get the same thing in English. So a little footnote did that. Mm. And I tended to use footnotes where I felt I, there was just some of the French is quite um, loosely referential and you wouldn't know what it's referring to if you didn't know the context. And I thought, I don't want to make the English so easy that I've given everything away. And that maybe goes back to what Matt's was saying about, um, you know, sort of how much you add into text. I think as someone who teaches, I tend to want people to understand. So I was reining in my make it easier instinct. It's a, uh, it's a formidable teaching tool, I think, because I, I mean, I know when mm. I set uh, the tragique in French that people won't read very much of it. It's just, it's really thorny uh, mm. linguistically, as well as being a kind of sort of daunting web of references. So to be able to, you know, look at some passages of it, but, but send them to this, um, I hope you won't think that's cheating, but I, I think it's extremely, um, it'll be useful to, to have on hand. I hope so. And I mean, I think it's true for France as well as England. I mean, I, I think Pierre, you and I had a conversation about it when we were talking that even for the French, if you're teaching at university, teaching Le Tragique, even a book of it is quite a big undertaking. I bet we're meant to wrap up soon, but if, if mm. we have time for one last question, does anyone? Okay. Am I allowed just a quick hello to Rachel, who's also here? Because it's just so lovely that I've got. Yes, three... no, we, we don't have to. Um, so Alice, Nikki, Rachel, you know, who are from many moons ago of my teaching career. But it's just lovely to see you still. Are you three from the same cohort? Yeah. Alice and I are. And then I know Nikki as well. Nikki was around at the same time. She's a bit younger. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's lovely to see you all. And isn't Charlotte? Isn't Charlotte? I, is that Charlotte? Yeah, I think that's true. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Oh, hello. Hi. Oh, hi. I'm sorry I couldn't see my name at the bottom. How lovely. I've been hiding. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Sean. <laughs> Great. Very um, thank you. I do translations and um, I don't do anything as difficult as that. <laughs> well, I was partly scared of having people here who really do translation. <laughs> I wouldn't attempt. I was going to ask, um, did you do this chronologically, starting at the beginning and going through? Did you pick some easy bits and then, um, you know? No, I actually, when I decided, the reason that actually started me on it was my daughter had studied history at Oxford and she was doing a week on the French Civil Wars and she said, oh, mum, I need something literary to put in my essay. Has anyone written about the civil wars in French, can you give me a sort of two line quote? So I said, oh yes, it's Daubigny. And she said, oh, it's in French. And she'd done A-level French. And she said, will I understand it? And I thought, well, you probably will, but you know, I can tell you what it means. And at the time I then thought, there must be a translation. I looked it up and there was this American PhD that you couldn't even get unless you sort of hunted for it of the first three books. I mean, it's not bad, but it hasn't got many notes and it was done without a lot of modern resources. So I thought if I'm gonna have a go, I'll start where that stopped, which was book four, which was Martyrs. And I started translating it 
in 2013 in October, November, and it was a very grim autumn. And I was doing the martyrs and they have awful deaths and I'm not very good at <laughs> And I almost gave up, but I thought, well, now I've done the martyrs, I'm going to keep going for a little bit, because book five, the bit I read about the um, massacres, it does have these wonderful highlight moments in it. And I think once I've broken through that, I thought, OK, I've got the courage to keep going for it. Um, if I started again, I might have started with a few of the, I don't know, if I started with the well-known bits, I might have felt really scared. I think so anyway, starting with the bits that people weren't going to be so critical of perhaps let me find my way around it I find that image of you having hymns in your ear really helpful I was going to ask you know were you thinking of Milton or I, I could certainly could never do anything if I had Milton in my ear but having it a sort of yes from the familiar tradition of a particular kind of Protestant discourse I think sense. it was Protestant discourse I mean I wouldn't dare to have had Milton in my ears most of the time, but I think hymns, um, also Psalms, sometimes I went back and looked at different translations of the Bible and sort of realized some of them were very modern and you know, racy and appropriate for some audiences, but not for what I wanted. Um, and I didn't want something on the other hand that read like 17th century. Um, the other thing is just sort of, you know, other people know as translators, I think distance is important. So I did the translation each day, I. If I was doing it consecutive days, I'd start by reading a bit of what I did the previous day, disagree entirely <laughs> with what I'd written the previous day and have a rework of it and then move on. And then I would come back to it after perhaps six months when I always felt it wasn't myself that had translated it. But it was so good when I had the three American scholars who know Dugne back to front and who then could look through it and say, oh, I think in this line you might have missed something or would you have thought of that translation? That was wonderful. It was like a dialogue. They were really thrilled to do it. I think it was, yeah, extremely yeah. exciting to have this thing come in into the world. Yeah, well, it's been great That's fun altogether. Valerie, thank you so much for this evening and thank you all. This is a really great gathering.